Hi, I'm Brett Heisen for Gen YTV. On August 16, 2011, Jason Puracall, an American Remax agent living in Nicaragua, was wrongfully accused and sentenced to 22 years in prison for drug trafficking, money laundering, and organized crime. With the help of the international rights community and his devoted sister Janice, an attorney living in Seattle, he was acquitted of all charges on September 12, 2012, after serving two years in prison. I spoke with Jason and Janice shortly after his release to learn the details of this story. Jason, walk us through the day of your arrest. On the Thursday, the 11th of November in 2010, the police stormed my office with assault rifles and in masks. Um, and I didn't know why they were there. I thought they were going to rob me. They didn't tell me anything. They had me sit in a, in a chair for about eight hours. One investigator came in. He wouldn't let me call my family. He wouldn't let me call my attorney. He wouldn't tell me why he was there, what he was looking for. Uh, he wouldn't show me any arrest warrants, nothing. And so I was... I didn't know for, for the first couple of days why I was even being detained. Janice, where were you at the time? I was at home that morning and I got a phone call from my mom who happened to be in Nicaragua visiting Jason at the time. And she called me and said, the police have taken your brother and they won't tell us where he is. You owned a Remax agency in San Juan del Sur. What were you working on at the time that might have caused a red flag? Nothing out of the ordinary, typical real estate transactions of foreigners, Americans, Canadians, and Europeans is what we specialized in that were investing in Nicaragua in the tourism sector. Jason had three partners in the agency. Why was he the only one arrested? Just shortly before the, the arrest, I mean a month or so before the arrest, two of the Americans had left the partnership and moved back to the U.S. Um, the hus husband and wife team and the wife was pregnant, so they moved home. And then the other partner was a silent partner who was very rarely in Nicaragua. So Jason was the only one actually in the office day to day managing everything and holding down the fort. So when the police arrived, he was the only one there. Who issued the arrest warrant? There was never a warrant issued. So we don't know who it was that actually okayed this arrest to go forward. The police seized the escrow accounts, yet admitted in court that they didn't know what an escrow account was. How is property in Nicaragua normally sold? The real estate transfers in Nicaragua, as far as I know, there's no set standards as far as how things are done. But because so many Americans have been buying down there, um, a lot of the sort of procedures that we use in the States and elsewhere in the world are making their way into Nicaragua. So things like escrow accounts are showing up and the, uh, the way that we do things in terms of closing documents and that sort of procedure is making its way down there because there is an influence of U.S. custom. So what happened to the money in the escrow accounts? Was it returned to the investors? The money that was in the escrow account for Remax was the money that the police had seized initially and that the prosecutor tried to say was illegal money. None of it actually belonged to Jason though. All of it belonged to Remax clients who had put the money in escrow in trust for sales of land. That money has never been returned and those clients have never been given an answer by the police or the prosecutor as to what's going to happen to that money. So how does the legal system in Nicaragua work? Did you receive a fair trial or have a jury? No, it was not. The, my trial was not a jury trial. It was held by uh, one guy who was not a registered judge. He wasn't even a registered attorney. Uh, so it was not a fair trial. Jason was denied many of his due process rights um, as well as the other 10 defendants in the case. You know, the other 10 defendants were Nicaraguans, but all 11 were denied the opportunity to see the prosecution's evidence before trial, and that is a right under Nicaraguan law. They requested that right and were denied access. Jason was denied the opportunity to speak with his um, attorney in confidence. That's also a right that he's afforded under Nicaraguan and international law, and he was denied that right. Instead, when the, the attorney would come to meet with Jason, he would be forced to sit in front of the police and the guards and talk about their strategy for trial. There was not a lot that could be done to prepare for trial when they're being monitored every step of the way and he has no access to the evidence. Jason was detained for nine months before being sentenced. What did the police have to gain by stalling the trial? That's a big question for me too and I think it kind of points out the obvious which is if they really had a case here, if they really had anything against Jason, they would have been pushing hard to get that trial right away. 
But instead, the police and the prosecutor delayed for months and months and months, and it took us nine months before we ever even got to trial. Did Remax offer any assistance during this process? Remax did not offer any assistance to us. Uh, we contacted them, we let them know what was happening, but they never reached out to us. So we really pushed this on more of the um, just gathering support from the international community and really fighting as hard as we could with what we had. You mentioned that there were 10 other defendants in this trial. What happened to them? All other 10 defendants were convicted along with Jason and received sentences anywhere from 16 years to 30 years. There was no evidence in the case against any of the 11 defendants. So all 11 should have been released immediately. And in fact, all 11, there was no basis to even arrest them in the first place. Fortunately, the appellate court was the one that stepped in and found that all 11 were entitled to go home and released all of them. Janice, you had a strong international support team back in this case, including Cash, Kotler, and Genser. How did you make that happen? That took some time. When we first started, this was my sister and I working out of our living room trying to get support. And we slowly added people to the team, and it was just networking and finding people with the right connections that we finally got to the team that we did and that was the phenomenal team that we had that finally made a difference. Jason, how were you able to follow the process of your case? It was very difficult. I had very limited communication. Um, they would allow me to use a, a, a phone in the office every once in a while, uh, but it was always a fight. Most of the time that I was in there, I really didn't know what was going on. Um, only through visits from my wife. Uh, and from my attorney and when my sisters and mother could come down and visit me. And you were held in La Modelo, which is one of Central America's most dangerous prisons. What were some of your survival mechanisms? Uh, just try to keep to myself. Um, you know, I wouldn't have survived, I don't think, uh, too much longer unless I had the support of my wife uh, and my sisters. Um, my wife brought me food whenever she could, but it was, you know, she got robbed three times coming to see me. Uh, so. It was not a, <laughs> a fun experience, and you know, I just tried to, to stay away from most people as much as I can, but I was still assaulted, was robbed several times. You both lost two years of your life during this case. What did you learn about yourself from this experience? You just have to live every moment uh, like it's your last moment and appreciate every moment uh, that you have because you don't know when it's going to be the last. I learned so many things about myself and about my brother and just the bond that we have and the strength that ties the two of us together and has allowed us to not only work our way through the worst time in our lives, but come out on the other side in a better way. Jason kept a journal during his time in prison and is currently writing a book dedicated to his son. To learn more about Jason Perkall and his story, follow him on Facebook. For Gen Y TV, I'm Britt Heisen.